December 1988, North Atlantic Ocean, 300 miles east of Newfoundland. Commander James Mitchell stood in the control room of USS Dallas, an American Los Angeles-class attack submarine, staring at a sonar display that showed something impossible. The contact his sonar operator had just detected was massive, far larger than any submarine should be. The acoustic signature suggested a vessel displacing nearly 50,000 tons, roughly the size of a World War II battleship. But this contact wasn't on the surface. It was underwater, cruising at a depth of 400 feet, moving at 18 knots through the freezing Atlantic waters. Mitchell's first thought was that his sonar equipment was malfunctioning, providing false readings that made a normal submarine appear gigantic. But the sonar operator, a 20-year veteran named Chief Petty Officer Robert Harkins insisted the readings were accurate. What they were tracking was real. And it was enormous. It was a Soviet Typhoon-class ballistic missile submarine, the largest submarine ever built. And it had just become Dallas's worst nightmare. The Typhoon-class represented the pinnacle of Soviet submarine engineering and the embodiment of Cold War one-upmanship. When NATO introduced the Ohio-class ballistic missile submarine in 1981, capable of carrying 24 Trident missiles, the Soviet Union responded with something even more intimidating. The Typhoon was designed to be unstoppable, unsinkable, and utterly terrifying. Each submarine measured 575 feet in length, longer than two American football fields placed end to end. The beam measured 75 feet wider than most highway overpasses, and the displacement of 48,000 tons when submerged made these boats larger than many surface warships. To put that in perspective, the battleship USS Iowa, one of the largest warships America produced during World War II, displaced 45,000 tons. The Typhoon was bigger than a battleship, and it operated underwater. But size was only part of what made Typhoons terrifying. The hull construction utilized titanium instead of steel, making it incredibly strong while keeping weight manageable. More importantly, Typhoons featured a unique double hull design. Most submarines have a single pressure hull containing the crew and equipment, surrounded by external ballast tanks and streamlining. Typhoons had two complete pressure hulls side by side, each capable of sustaining the crew independently if the other was damaged. This redundancy meant that a torpedo hitting one pressure hull wouldn't necessarily sink the submarine. The crew could seal off the damaged hull and continue operating using the intact one. Soviet naval architects believed this made typhoons effectively invulnerable to torpedo attack. Even multiple torpedo hits might not sink a typhoon. The submarine could absorb damage that would destroy any other vessel and continue its mission. On the fall, strategic purpose of typhoons was equally intimidating. Each submarine carried 20 R-39 ballistic missiles, each missile capable of delivering 10 independently targetable nuclear warheads. That meant a single typhoon submarine could launch 200 nuclear warheads at targets across North America or Europe. The missiles had a range exceeding 5,000 miles which meant typhoons didn't need to leave Soviet territorial waters to threaten the entire Western world. They could patrol beneath the Arctic ice, protected by geography and the difficulty of conducting anti-submarine operations in those frozen waters, and remain capable of destroying civilization. NATO submarine commanders referred to typhoons as doomsday boats, and the name was earned. Finding and destroying typhoons before they could launch their missiles was one of NATO's highest priorities. It was also considered nearly impossible. Commander Mitchell had been briefed on typhoon capabilities during his training, but briefings couldn't prepare him for the reality of tracking one. Dallas had been on patrol in the North Atlantic for six weeks, conducting routine surveillance operations, when Harkins detected the distinctive acoustic signature that indicated a typhoon was in the area. Standard procedure was to establish contact, track the target, and gather intelligence on its operational patterns. But establishing contact with a typhoon was proving far more difficult than Mitchell had anticipated. The submarine was quiet, surprisingly so, for something displacing 50,000 tons. Soviet engineers had gone to extraordinary lengths to reduce the typhoon's acoustic signature. Machinery was mounted on sound dampening systems, 
The propeller design minimized cavitation noise. Even the double hull construction helped reduce noise by providing additional sound insulation. Harkins could detect the typhoon, but maintaining consistent sonar contact was challenging. Mitchell ordered Dallas to maneuver into a trailing position, attempting to follow the typhoon from behind, where the Soviet submarine's sonar systems would have difficulty detecting the American boat. But something strange was happening. Harkins kept losing and reacquiring the contact. The acoustic signature would fade below detection threshold, disappear completely for minutes at a time, then suddenly return. This wasn't normal behavior for a submarine contact. It suggested Dallas was operating at the edge of detection range, which should have been impossible given the typhoon's size. A submarine that massive should be detectable at ranges exceeding 10,000 yards. Yet Dallas was struggling to maintain contact at less than 8,000 yards. Mitchell realized that acoustic tracking alone wouldn't work. The typhoon was too quiet, too well designed, too careful about noise discipline. He needed another way to track the Soviet submarine. That's when Mitchell remembered something from a classified briefing he'd attended. Six months earlier, at submarine headquarters in Norfolk, a naval intelligence officer had discussed Soviet submarine magnetic signatures. Every submarine creates a magnetic anomaly because the steel and titanium hull materials distort Earth's magnetic field. Submarines carry magnetic detection equipment specifically designed to detect these anomalies, but the equipment had traditionally been considered unreliable because the anomalies were weak and difficult to distinguish from geological magnetic variations on the ocean floor. The intelligence officer had mentioned that larger submarines created correspondingly larger magnetic anomalies, but nobody had really investigated whether those anomalies were significant enough to be useful for tracking. Mitchell decided to find out. Dallas carried a sensitive magnetometer originally installed for mine detection operations. The equipment could detect magnetic field variations with extraordinary precision. Mitchell ordered his weapons officer to activate the magnetometer and sweep the area where sonar had last detected the typhoon. Within seconds, the magnetometer registered a massive magnetic anomaly bearing 045 degrees, exactly where the typhoon should be based on its last known position. The magnetic signature was unmistakable, far stronger than anything Mitchell had seen during previous operations. He ordered Dallas to maneuver toward the anomaly using the magnetometer to track the Soviet submarine. The magnetometer continued to show the massive magnetic signature, allowing Dallas to follow the typhoon even when sonar contact was lost. Mitchell had discovered the typhoon's fatal weakness. The mathematics were straightforward once Mitchell understood what he was seeing. The typhoon's enormous hull, constructed from thousands of tons of titanium and steel, created a magnetic anomaly so distinctive that it could be detected at ranges exceeding 12,000 yards under favorable conditions. The double hull construction that made typhoons nearly unsinkable also doubled the magnetic signature by essentially placing two large magnetic masses side by side. What Soviet engineers had designed as the submarine's greatest strength, its unprecedented size and robust construction, had become its greatest vulnerability. The submarine that was supposed to be undetectable and unsinkable could be tracked using magnetic detection at ranges where acoustic tracking was impossible. The unstoppable doomsday boat had become the easiest target in the Soviet fleet to find. Mitchell immediately transmitted his findings back to submarine headquarters using secure communications. The response was swift and definitive. Other NATO submarines operating in the North Atlantic were ordered to test magnetic tracking techniques against Typhoon-class submarines whenever opportunities arose. Within three months, submarine commanders from American, British and Norwegian boats confirmed Mitchell's discovery. Every Typhoon, tracked using magnetometers, showed the same distinctive signature. The magnetic anomaly was detectable at ranges between 8,000 and 12,000 yards depending on water depth and geological conditions. More importantly, the signature was unique to typhoons. No other submarine class created a magnetic anomaly of that magnitude. This meant NATO submarines could distinguish typhoons from other Soviet submarines at ranges where visual identification was impossible. The tactical implications were revolutionary. 
NATO anti-submarine warfare doctrine had assumed typhoons would be extraordinarily difficult to locate and track. The submarine's ability to operate under Arctic ice, combined with their quiet acoustic signatures, suggested they would spend most of their patrol time effectively invisible. NATO war plans had allocated enormous resources to the problem of finding typhoons, including deployment of attack submarines dedicated solely to hunting the Soviet giants. Mitchell's discovery changed everything. Typhoons weren't invisible. They were broadcasting their location through magnetic signatures that couldn't be disguised or reduced. Soviet engineers could make typhoons quieter, could improve their sonar systems, could add more armor or redundant systems, but they couldn't eliminate the magnetic signature without fundamentally redesigning the submarines using non-magnetic materials. And that was economically and technically impossible. The Soviet Union apparently never realized NATO had discovered this vulnerability. Typhoons continued operating throughout the late 1980s and early 90s, using the same patrol patterns, the same operational procedures, the same assumptions about their invulnerability. Meanwhile, NATO submarines tracked them with ease, gathering intelligence on their patrol routes, their communication protocols, their tactical procedures. The submarine that was designed to be unstoppable had become an intelligence goldmine. Every typhoon patrol provided NATO with detailed information about Soviet strategic nuclear submarine operations. When the Cold War ended in 1991, NATO possessed comprehensive intelligence on typhoon capabilities, vulnerabilities, and operational patterns, all because one American submarine commander decided to try tracking with a magnetometer instead of relying solely on sonar. The typhoons themselves remained in Soviet and later Russian service for decades. The last one was finally retired in 2023, more than 30 years after NATO discovered their fatal weakness. During all those years, these massive submarines continued to patrol, continued to carry their world-ending arsenals, and continued to broadcast their positions through magnetic signatures they couldn't eliminate. The submarines built to be unsinkable were sinkable. The submarines designed to be undetectable were detected. And the weakness that doomed them was discovered not through espionage or stolen documents, but through operational experimentation by a submarine commander who decided to try something unconventional. The Typhoon-class submarines remain the largest submarines ever built, monuments to Soviet engineering ambition, but they also remain examples of how size and strength can become vulnerabilities when opponents discover ways to exploit the very characteristics intended to provide invincibility.